Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, and you're watching Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today, and I literally have a ringside seat to today's show because we are doing this live and in person here at the Hoover Institution because we have a very special guest who I'll get to in a moment. I'm joined as usual by the three stars of our show, who we call the Good Fellows. That would be the economist John Cochran, the historian Neil Ferguson, the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, and as proof that we actually read what you write to us in terms of what you want in content and who you want in guests. Today, here by very popular demand, you've begged for him, you've pleaded for him, you've beseeched for him. Here he is live and in person, the one and only Stephen Kotkin. <laughs> Steve Kotkin is the Hoover Institution's Klein Heinz Senior Fellow. He's also a senior fellow at Stanford University's Freeman Foley Institute for International Studies. He's a Princeton University professor emeritus. His field of expertise is geopolitics and authoritarian regimes, a very popular topic here on the show. Steve, welcome to Goodfellows at long last. Can you give me the name of the two people who wrote to you asking for me to be on the show? <laughs> Mrs. Kotkin, like Mrs. Kotkin was one. <laughs> I'd like to thank them. It's okay. great to be here, Bill. Thank you for the invitation. We got to start by addressing the elephant in the room. This is Goodfellows, the movie Goodfellows star Joe Pesci. It has been brought to my attention more than once that you sound a little bit like Joe Pesci. Is it just a, is this just something I'm imagining, or have you heard this before? So when I was growing up, I wanted to be Joe Pesci. <laughs> <laughs> and you succeeded. You always wanted to be a gangster. <laughs> I grew up, and it turned out there was already a Joe Pesci, and they didn't need a second one. <laughs> So here I am, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I wanted to be John Cleese, and there was already one of them. Yeah, Neil, by the way, does a pretty good Pesci himself. Not as good as you. I don't pretend. <laughs> Okay, Steve, let's get down to business here. Uh, let's start today by talking about China, and uh, here's what I'm curious about. Uh, in 1966, Mao Zedong jumps into the Yangtze River. This is a very symbolic act. He's trying to convince his people he is swimming across the Yangtze. Why? China's crossing a river. The Cultural Revolution is about to commence. I think that Xi Jinping may have crossed a river recently when, during the course of the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's Congress, he made it a point to perp walk. Hu Jintao out of the, out of the uh, meeting. So I'm curious, you know China very well, Neil does HR, John studies it as well. What message was Xi trying to send to both his people and the world by committing this very public act of humiliation? Yeah, it, it was quite the incident. Uh, he committed the act already by the personnel he purged from the higher bodies and the ones he included in the higher bodies. That had been pre-decided and, and so it was a done deal. There was documentation about that, about who was in and who was out. We have no idea whether Hu Jintao was made aware of that information about the, the inclusion and exclusion on the higher bodies while he was seated there before he got into his seat. It looks like he tried to take a piece of paper from his neighbor to have a look and see who, Who's on the standing committee? Am I, yeah, am I in there? Are any of my people in there? And it looks like that might have precipitated uh, his eviction uh, from the scene. I'm not sure, therefore, that she premeditated, uh, had a premeditated plan to evict him, uh, because who might have accidentally provoked the situation by reaching for the paper? It could have been that that was a premeditated plan. We'll have to wait to see if we get lucky and someone upstairs leaks to us. But the message is clear whether it was intended or not, which is to say that this nasty SOB is the only guy in charge and everybody is a sycophant under him and they owe their positions to him and that's China going forward. We've never had an economy this large run by a political system this opaque. And so we're in for quite the ride and I'll let our other guests uh, pick up on that. But I, I'm not optimistic about the corrective mechanisms now inside that regime. Steve, I have a question. Uh, I think of you primarily as a, an expert on the Soviet Union and you're writing the definitive biography of Stalin. And so you're usually asked about Russia, but Russia today is in no way uh, a direct lineal descendant of Stalin's Soviet Union. Whereas China under Xi Jinping has distinct Marxist-Leninist 
and even Stalinist characteristics. Am I right? Yeah, so the Leninist structure never went away, which is the party's monopoly on power. Uh, you can't be half communist, just like you can't be half pregnant. You are either a communist monopoly or you don't have your monopoly and there are other parties or other political movements that want a voice and a say. So that's always been true. Uh, there was the illusion that the ideology was dead, even if the Leninist structure had uh, survived. But because the ideology seemed dead, people also thought that the Leninist structure didn't matter, that they were promoting on the basis of merit, uh, that it was too big, too large a society to manage with a communist monopoly, and that communism would fade over time, especially because the ideology was dead. Lo and behold, there's this thing called the Central Party School. They all have to go through the Central Party School. They all read those great texts of Mao and Stalin and the rest of them and now Xi Jinping, and they study the Soviet collapse, which is the number one subject at the party school. Absolutely. God forbid they should do a stupid Gorbachev-like reform right. and commit suicide. So this has been clear to people who had an understanding of the Leninist regime, as opposed to who thought that Xi Jinping was a private equity mogul, yeah. like they are, and was worried about shaving a point or two off his GDP. Um, and so he would never do that. That would hurt his growth. And of course, he'll shave as much off his GDP as he feels is necessary in order to keep that party monopoly. And when people say, well, living standards will go down and, and, and we'll lose the bargain between the regime and the people, you know, the bargain where the regime raises living standards and the people give up their freedom for the regime. Actually, there is no bargain. Because if the regime fails to raise living standards, it doesn't say, oh, you know, John, I'm really sorry. Your living standards didn't go up. I'm going to leave power voluntarily now because I, I didn't keep my end of the bargain. Or Neil says, you know what? You didn't keep your end of the bargain. I'll take you to court and I'll sue you because the bargain, you're in violation of it. In fact, that's why they have the Ministry of State Security because they don't need a bargain with the people. They got a gigantic security apparatus. That's what it's for. There is one big difference between current China and Maoist China or Stalinist Russia, and that is the economy. Uh, Stalinist Russia was never able to produce a functioning economy, as you wrote so beautifully. China did grow spectacularly. There was a vibrant private sector. At, I don't know how much you want to call it private public, um, but. Uh, they have certainly done something very different from Stalinist Russia. Now, they may be about to kill that, uh, uh, that, that golden goose. We'll see. But that was something quite different. I'm curious your view. How much, how much private economy was there really? How, how did they manage to let, um, to let state-controlled businesses flourish, do amazing amounts of economic growth in the last 20, 30 years? in a way that Russia was just not able to do by their five-year plans, by their ownership of all property, by, you know, by the standard Stalinist system. That economic system is quite different. Yes, it is. They went from $200 billion GDP to $18 trillion, or however you want to measure it, whether you want it in absolute terms uh, by the currency exchange rate or you want whatever to do it purchasing. They, they've gone from a few hundred billion to or, or multiple trillions. Five, 500 bucks a person to now close to 20,000 bucks a person. That's just yeah. the most spectacular growth out of extreme yeah. poverty so, we've ever seen. So how'd that happen? Let's remember that the Soviet Union had a military industrial complex that was on a very high level. It wasn't cost efficient. A guy who's maybe got a background in neoclassical economics would see a lot of waste, a lot of failure, to uh, manage costs and producing products that the quality varied. But nonetheless, they were able to reach parity with us militarily, more or less, in the 70s, uh, which is a pretty big achievement given the size of the US economy. The Soviet economy was never, in my view, larger than about one third the size of the US economy. So to have a military industrial complex on that scale parity with the U.S. with one-third of the economy is a kind of achievement, uh, but it's nothing like what the Chinese have done. So how did this happen? The story that you're going to get usually is the Communist Party. 
look at this amazing management system, authoritarianism, meritocracy. It goes back to the civil exam to get into the bureaucracy in China. And it's, it's a combination of both Chinese history and this dexterous, fantastic, authoritarian Communist Party. Well, of course, that's bunk, obviously. Uh, what happened was uh, the Cultural Revolution that Bill uh, brought up earlier, um, uh, Mao, in 66, decided to target his own state. He decided to disorganize communist organization. One of the upshots of that was he destroyed the planning mechanism. So the planned economy personnel were no longer sitting in their big bureaucratic offices in the capital. They were out in the countryside performing manual labor or somehow atoning uh, for the sin of having an education. And so this cultural revolution destroyed the planning uh, apparatus to a large extent, not completely, but to a large extent. And the peasants decided they didn't want to starve again. They had starved I don't know how many times. Some of them starved and died, of course, they weren't around, but some of them starved and lived. We talk about famine in terms of deaths. We don't talk about famine in terms of survivors, but millions of people died in the famine and millions more starved and survived somehow. Are they going to starve again? And they decided no. So in that a very large area of coastal China, you know, China is like India, a monsoon civilization where the, the, the monsoon enables them to have a wet rice uh, cultivation in the areas of the south. That's the rich part of the country, uh, south and southeastern China. And so the peasants decided that they wanted to live, and therefore they reinstituted market relations illegally with each other. And they began to leave the communes, not formally, because that w wasn't allowed, but, but to ignore the statutes on the commune, uh, the collectivized version of their life, and to engage in the kind of market behavior that a guy like you would recognize as highly productive and better than the economy that they had. The Communist Party sort of latched on to this and said, OK, a little bit of market relations. How about if you trade onions, but you can't trade rice? And the peasants ignore this, and they trade the rice. And they say, OK, you can trade the rice, the party decree says, but you can only trade on Mondays and Wednesdays. And the, and the peasants decide, well, we'll trade on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday also. And so it goes on like this grudging acceptance of the peasant recreation of a market economy. And so 600 million peasants rejoined the world economy through their own hard work and entrepreneurialism. And the Communist Party, under Deng Xiaoping, grudgingly, in stages, you can go back and look at the decrees, accepted this market behavior but tried to control it. So they had special economic zones. You know, I think this is so important because the, you know, the, the narrative is the party succeeded, right, in lifting you know, 800 million people out of, out of poverty, you know, and, and I think what you're pointing out, Stephen, is that hey, it was actually the Chinese people who did this, despite the, the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, would you agree with that? Kate Zhou, Z-H-O-U, has a brilliant book about how this happened in, in the countryside. She has a village-level study of the very processes that we're talking about. So the party hijacked the process and the credit for it. But right. we're not just talking so, so village but, wait, markets. We, we built the, factories, export-oriented, high-tech manufacturing. Then this went is up the, the economic value story. Chain. Yeah. The standard economic story is the party let free markets happen, let private enterprise happen, let open trade happen, and boom, you get... Why do you need a special economic zone if you're going to let it happen? Well, that's... You're trying to contain it to, to contain the, quote, it. special economic zone because you don't want the whole country to become... Here's the one thing the party did do that was crucial in the geostrategic sense. So this is not Nixon and Kissinger going to China. We'll hear that story not long from now in print again, <laughs> but maybe the better version this time. Uh, this is not Nixon and Kissinger because Mao didn't care much about trade. Mao was not really economically literate, as we were just discussing. But Deng Xiaoping comes to the US under Jimmy Carter and famously puts on the cowboy hat that's about the same size as him, that 10-gallon hat. And he decides 
that he's going to change partners. He's going to divorce the Soviet Union, and he's going to marry the U.S. It's going to become the de facto economic partnership. How did Deng figure this out? Well, he lives across the water from Japan. There's this country, Japan, which is just annihilated in World War II and is ashes. And then you blink your eye, and it's the second largest economy in the world. What happened? And then, of course, South Korea repeats this, and Taiwan repeats this. So the answer is they were allowed to sell products into the American domestic market, and they were able to create products that American consumers wanted to buy. So same thing with Dong. He got most favored nation status, most favored nation trading status, already in 1980. This was under Carter, just before Reagan uh, displaced Carter. And so from that date, each year it had to be um, uh, renewed by the Congress until finally it was granted uh, permanently as a result of the WTO accession. But so China now had the Japanese model, which was to say free and open access to the American market. An American middle class will buy a lot of stuff, as you know, and can drive in uh, GDP growth with consumer-led um, uh, but he, he allowed that to happen internally. The big barrier was not whether the U.S. would buy the goods. The big barrier is, are you allowed to start a factory and keep the profits? Those same peasants who recreated the market economy and barter relations during the Cultural Revolution in the mid to late 70s moved to the towns, created township enterprises, moved to the cities, created little family enterprises, and just like in Italy in the Middle Ages, the family enterprises grew in many cases uh, because they work really hard, they, they understand credit, and et cetera, all the things you would know. And finally, you blink your eye, and there's this very substantial private economy that the party has grudgingly allowed to happen that uh, doesn't have a lot of stuff in its way because the state-owned part of the economy is so inefficient and so useless and by the way, it's a good source of raw materials and, and other things that you can uh, latch your hands onto. Where does the party come back in? The party comes back in when it decides that, hey, you know, these entrepreneurial people, they're onto something. Let's take away their businesses. And so you have massive expropriation by the party of the private sector. This is the next stage of the process. And they, they, they have land, which they control. They don't actually own it. The state owns it, but they control it locally. And they sell that land to private uh, entrepreneurs who then build factories or build warehouses or whatever it might be. But here's another part that the party steals credit for that it doesn't deserve. Hong Kong. People ask me all the time, how come Gorbachev didn't do a China? Well, first, they didn't have enough Chinese. Secondly, <laughs> Uh, so, that, right, that would be a big that would be a big barrier. Secondly, he had no Hong Kong, which is to say a private entrepot, a financial system with the rule of law that made decisions, investment decisions based upon economic, not political criteria. And so all the money that came in from Taiwan and Japan, as well as from Hong Kong, was funneled through Hong Kong investment entities which invested in the special economic zones and tapped into this entrepreneurialism that flourished and then tapped into the corrupt party officials that, that expropriated this. And so you have a picture where the party doesn't do this, the society does it, as, as the general said. And then Hong Kong does most of it. And then the Japanese and Taiwanese supply a lot of the capital and the technology. By the way, technology transfer to China is written into the GATT and written into the WTO. Um, it was a, a goal that we pursued. And, so, and then this becomes an across-the-board, bipartisan, you know, across-the-aisle bipartisan policy of the U.S. to raise China into this successful partner in the international system. It, it starts with the Kissinger wanting to balance against the Soviet Union. And then it becomes all the other things that we so live through. a couple more stages to the process, which, which Go you're ahead. Bringing, bringing in here. I mean, and one of them, which you've alluded to, is that uh, the, the U.S. essentially sponsors China's development. Uh, and, and that leads to a great flow of capital and, uh, and entrepreneurship and technology from the West to China. 
because big Western corporations discover a huge opportunity, which is uh, takes the form of very low Chinese unit labor costs, yeah. to shift manufacturing to China. I mean, that is essentially what Apple does, but it's not the only one. Huge numbers of, of, of U.S. companies decide we can make this stuff cheaper in China. So this also is- at scale, Neil. Right. Let's remember, Apple could make 10 million phones in Vietnam, but they can make 100 million phones and 500 million phones in China because of the scale of the supply chain. And there's a so it's for irresistible it. and it's a trade-off for, for them. The Americans are essentially going to have their technology and their intellectual property stolen, but it's still worth it because there's such a huge cost advantage and a scale advantage. The second thing which I think is really mm-hmm. important is Chinese education is delivering a lot of very high-skilled people uh, who also have access to Western education. So there's a big, uh, I think, a big educational piece to what I call Chimerica back in 2007. So Chimerica involves not just U.S. technology transfer to China. There's also lots of back and forth of the uh, the educated uh, Chinese who are, are going to run these uh these operations uh, in China. They, they're getting a lot of know-how from places like, like Stanford. But there's one thing that mm. never changes through all of this, and that is that the party retains critical parts of the economy under its control, like the banking system yeah. is entirely under the control of the party. And when Xi Jinping comes to power, a subtle shift happens back in favor of state-owned enterprises to the disadvantage of this private sector, particularly when it comes to access to credit. And this is one of the things that she changes that if you were paying close attention, told you that he was going to be a different kind of leader from his uh, from his predecessors, a leader who prioritized the power of the party over the economic growth rate. It took us a long time to figure this out. In fact, to me, one it of took the some people longer than others. Right. Yeah. So there was a tremendous Some people still lag. don't get it. Yeah. yeah. But there was a huge lag in, real, in, in understanding what was going on after Yeah. Okay. Okay. Before we, we get to the geopolitical in China, so let's just celebrate what happened. Yeah. That the, the uh, a billion people escape horrible poverty. Should that, that should happen to India. That should happen to Africa. It was a great, it was the greatest increase in human welfare we've seen. Now, yes, there's a, there, we'll get to the geopolitical. I want to ask, is this all over? Are we going back to North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, if the party takes over? But let's not immediately jump to how terrible it was that the U.S. let China escape 500 bucks a person per year and get to 20,000 a year of a billion people. Um, There's no doubt that this is a miracle and that millions and millions of lives got better as a result of this and that... in. Americans lost jobs and other Americans benefited from this. And then you could talk about Western Europe benefiting, you can talk about Japan benefiting, you can talk, if you know what you're talking about, like John Cochran, the inflation effects or non-inflation effects as the case might be. You can talk about all sorts of important, really world historical developments, there's no doubt about that. I would just reduce the billion to the 600 to 800 million because there's at least 600 million and probably 800 million Chinese who are not part of the world economy. They are not educated. They they didn't finish high school. They can't get prescription glasses. They have no health care. This is part of what's known as invisible China. Our colleague Scott Rosell, right here on the Stanford campus, probably the best book on China that no one's ever read, although that's a category you don't want to give away that prize very easily. Invisible China. So there is a big story here, and that big story is one of not foreign aid, but internal economic dynamism that produces a better life for a lot of people. The question, though, is who did that and how did they do that? And the answer is if it wasn't the party that did it all along the way, as I think there seems to be a consensus here, the party did something smart. It said, we're going to copy what Japan did. We're going to partner with the U.S. as our economic partner, sell into the American middle class. They had to be capable of selling products that American consumers would buy. For example, Romania didn't have a lot of products that the American middle class was ready to buy, but the Chinese ended up having that. But is this, so, is this so, now? So that's, the, that's on the Chinese people. That is credit to them for incredible success, credit to Hong Kong, right? Credit to a lot of people, and you can argue that it happened much more quickly than we understood, and therefore that was part of the naivete of assisting it, 
We didn't think that it would happen this quickly. In other words, that they would become a peer competitor within two generations or a generation oh, and a half. Being, and, being and would wealthy, not liberalize because well, we assumed we didn't guys, know that being the wealthy growth, and productive is not a competitor. There's a ge geostrategic question, which we're going to get to, Go HR, yeah. about, uh, about competition. But simply being wealthy, the European Union is wealthy and productive, and that is not a com competitor to the U.S. It's not a problem for us at all. Right. The is this now system. over? I, I think system. we were right that economic freedom and wealth would lead to a demand for political freedom, and China had to choose political freedom or clamp down. It's choosing clamp down. Uh, the party cannot stay in control of a free market economy. That's correct. Are we now headed to a, a disastrous decline? Can I tell one story just to amplify, I think, what might be a turning point? And, and Stephen, I, I don't think the party understands that the Chinese people should get credit for lifting 600 to 800 million people out of, out of poverty. That's I think the party they thinks they, the they, should get, they should get the credit. Yeah, so, sure. so they want more, you know, more communist party, right, and, and, and more uh, control. Uh, in the last meeting that we had in the Great Hall of the People during Donald Trump's visit there, mm -hmm. during a day of meetings, and, you know, he was kind of tired or anybody, you know, a little bit grumpy at the end of the, at, at the, this last meeting, it was with Lee Keshong. And he couldn't understand, like, why am I meeting with Lee Keshong? Why am I meeting with the prime, premier? I just met with Xi Jinping, but it was a formality, right, because uh, yeah. he's the nominal you know, head of state. So, so uh, but Lee Keshong went into a long monologue. And in it, he basically said, we don't need you anymore. And, and, uh, and, and he said, if you're lucky, you know, uh, you can transfer some, some more of your technology to us, but mainly you're going to sell us agricultural goods mm -hmm. and, and, and energy, you know, hydrocarbons. Yeah. And that's going to be the role of, of, of the United States in the future. And of course, after which Donald Trump said, okay, thanks, stood up and we just all laughed. Right? So, but, I thought, but I thought that this meeting was, was important because, you know, Lee Keshong, who was always seen, right, as, as you know, sort of Western leaning and everything. Uh, was not really Western leaning. He was basically saying that period of partnering with the United States, not necessary anymore. We're on our own now, uh, and, and we're going to eclipse the United States as, as the preponderant power economically. I and think, yeah, I think we'll look back and see that that was the hubris of, yes, of yeah, Xi Jinping. Absolutely. The notion that they actually had, had more or less achieved parity and that we were doomed to decline. And that hubris, I, I think, reached a climax in 2020 when they thought yes. that the pandemic had exposed us as completely uh, de deficient and, mm -hmm. and their superior zero COVID policy was going to Absolutely. be the key to success. And here we are, fast forward a couple of years, and they're trapped in a policy that has become close, so closely identified with Xi Jinping himself that they can't actually end it. That means the economy, to go back to John's question, yeah. is in a trap that it can't get out of. Consumption is way down because it's pretty hard to have dynamic consumption if you're being locked down uh, every other month. And I do think that to answer your question, John, there's an economic crisis. It's latent, but it's there. And it's not just about zero COVID. It's also about the demographics, which are dreadful. I mean, the population of China could half between now and the end of the century, if you look at the worst case scenario in the UN population projections. And here's the thing we have it's to do. It's the crackdown on the tech sector. The it's tech all sector, which is one thing the party right. never really controlled, but it decided it was time to bring Jack Ma uh, to heel. But there's yeah. one thing we haven't talked about, although we, we touched on it briefly. Right at the heart of China's economy now uh, is the real estate sector. And our friend Ken Rogoff has written very persuasively about this. And the real estate game where you know, the government would sell the land to the property developers, they would get a piece of the action and they'd build tower blocks and a huge percentage of economic activity was in fact building urban infrastructure. That's game over now. And it depended you're, on future sales. So you're building you know, tower, blocks for no, tower blocks for nobody. The, the population's in decline. Right, so well, now they're blowing them up. And, and, of and, course they are. You know, Keynesian stimulus, number 101, <laughs> build a tower and blow it up. But John did ask the, the, John did ask the most important question. Okay, yeah. is it over, Stephen? Like, now, uh, how do? What is your? What is your view of the of the you know the near future? Yeah, why don't we close out with this? Shift? Why don't we close out? What What are the next five years hold for China? With the, party, the party trying the to stay totally in control. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you know this is a great show, but you're asking a historian who studies the past now to tell you to predict the future, the next five years. Is that normal? For it's this normal. Show? It's normal. You can only be better than me. I mean, be, it's a lot better than asking a social scientist. I'll tell you that. No offense to social scientists. No, I, who we if love. I had a good read on the future, John, <laughs> I think I would not be in this chair. I'd be in a different chair, which was a lot more comfortable and expensive. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, make it look like I'm trying to shirk my duty here and avoid your question. So this is the answer to your question. 
the extent to which you think the party is able to tolerate private sector wealth and independent power, you think that growth can come back. To the extent that you think the party is not going to tolerate that, they're not going to tolerate the job creation and GDP growth that the private sector provides. When they talk about you can establish a private company, but just don't get too big, uh, that is a self-limiting, obviously, uh, policy right there. Alibaba. And then, of course, there's the expropriation that continues. He fights corruption of the people he doesn't like and enables the people who are on his side, his favorites, to acquire property and wealth. So, so if you think that they need the private sector like oxygen, can't give it up and will be compelled by reality to indulge it going forward, you could potentially be somewhat optimistic about the Chinese growth model. If, however, you're persuaded that the Leninist system is for real, Xi Jinping is for real on top of that, that the system selects for certain leaders. It's not the personality of the leader per se. It's the kind of person that again and again gets to the top of these systems to, as it were, defend the system against these. And then if you want to talk about the larger strategic environment they're in where they make a lot of enemies and they make profound enemies out of people who want to be their friends and and, we, and then you talk about the strategic shift that happened in American policy under the general when he was a national security advisor and Mike Pompeo was secretary of state and Matt Pottinger was uh, the general's deputy. You want to talk about the fact that things are not going their way. But you're right, they think things are going their way. And so that is potentially the, the most important answer to your question. But the Russians thought things were going their way for 70 years until all of a sudden they weren't. But, but my point being is that if they're persuaded that they're in the right by strangling the private sector and acting aggressively abroad and that this is working for them, that and if, if they're persuaded they're in the right, it's likely they'll continue those kind of policies, in which case the answer to your question is um, re look over your portfolio one more time for China exposure. <laughs> On to Russia, Steve. So this show has a global reach, and there might be young men and women in Russia watching this, and maybe they've read your books, and maybe they've grown up on Neil Ferguson, and maybe they're familiar with John Cochran and H.R. McMaster, and they want to be historians. The question, Steve, if you want to study Russia, history in Russia right now, what are you being taught, and to what extent is history right now being rewritten for an Russian audience? Yeah, so inside Russia, the situation is very grim. It's not quite the same as growing up one day in Nazi Germany in January 1933, where one day you were living in the Weimar Republic and the next day you weren't anymore. It's not quite analogous to that, uh, but you can put it in the same sentence now. It's, uh, it's been shocking for Russians, not only young Russians, by the way, but it's been shocking for them what's happened to their society. Now, the regime does not have the kind of control that Stalin exercised over the society. It doesn't have the kind of control that Xi Jinping uh, dreams about and in some cases has over Chinese society because of the surveillance um, uh, technology, some of which uh, our friends, Neil's friends especially, were um, supplied, the Chinese regime. But financed by, you know, U.S. venture capital firms. Yes. So it, it, Russia Which doesn't. Friends are you alluding? Oh, I feel I have to distance myself from this. Uh, this subtle okay, I don't know who sold them all that technology that we invented. All my friends. Uh, they they're not your friends anymore, is what you're insinuating. Never my friends. So okay, fair well, the, point. Turning the COVID surveillance into the surveillance state is one of the very interesting stories of, of uh, why they are not abandoning. But by the way, just interaction. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, go remarkable ahead. to illustrate that the surveillance system is already in place. That it, people who were involved in runs on back on provincial banks that people were complaining yeah. that they couldn't get their deposits there. those people are now finding themselves subject to travel bans because the social credit system is already up and running there's nothing like that or nothing remotely but like that back to russia but back to russia i'm curious you can control the media can you control academia uh yes you can to a certain extent because there's a selection process 
who's going to go in in the first place and who's going to survive that type of atmosphere? It's going to be the people who feel comfortable with the hyper-nationalist, xenophobic um, version of history in which Stalin committed no crimes but was a military genius, in which the Russians are victims rather than perpetrators, and in which there are, there's a fifth column of traitors at home in cahoots with foreign enemies who are trying to pull Russia down. If you're going to be comfortable with that, you're going to go into the field or you're going to advance in the field. And so there's going to be, let's say, incentive mechanisms created for a certain type of person. Plus, if you disagree, you get fired. If you, dis if you disagree, you don't have a lot of options. You can be drafted, uh, no matter what age you are, to serve in Ukraine. If you have an alternative view of history and you're working at the university, they can include your name on the list of those available for the draft. Uh, you can flee to Yerevan or Belisi or um, Belgrade and all the other places that Russians can travel without a visa, at least initially. And so we've seen quite a bit of that. Um, they couldn't manage the new economy. The new economy, they gagged on it, as a result of which Russia's entire private IT sector now lives in Yerevan and it lives in Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, right? If you did a per capita um, of a tech, high-skilled tech workers per capita, California would be number one, and now Armenia would be number two, and Kyrgyzstan is closing in on number three. Absolutely. Not because they developed uh, their own domestic human capital there. It's because that's where Russia's went. Uh, right now, uh, Tel Aviv, for example, has an incredible high-tech private sector, which is also Russian-speaking and Russian in origin. So they're willing, the regime is willing to hemorrhage that kind of human capital all across the board. And by the it's, way, we ought to be giving them H-1B visas to come here, I mean. Uh, we are, n our policy. And Chinese. <laughs> yeah, our policy is complex here because they're Russians and Russians are now perpetrating the war against Ukraine and we're not uh, capable well, let's say government agencies are not easily capable of differentiating between Russians we might want to support and Russians we might not want to support because they're part of the war effort. But, but anyway, to get back to your point, so the same thing works in the historical profession as is working in IT and everything else. Independent thinking, uh, evidence-based research, and uh, patriotism, but patriotism with criticism, right? You know, Mark Twain that great line, you support your country 100% of the time and you support your government when it deserves it. And so that version of patriotism or nationalism is now out of the question. Well, and I think also though, could you compare the mechanisms that Putin has put in place to stay in power and maybe how Stalin uh, consolidated power yeah. the, relative to the weakness of Khrushchev, for example, and then maybe the collapse yeah. of Gorbachev in the great book that you wrote called Uncivil Society, right? And where you really challenged the conventional wisdom that these were civil society uprisings that affected the, the great changes in Eastern Europe and, and, and Russia, you argue that it was really the elites. So I'd love to hear yeah. how you see Putin in those various contexts in terms of his grip on power and how he's consolidated power. Yeah, so we're not gonna put too many people in Stalin's category here on managing a regime. Um, he's kind of the gold standard in some ways of uh, despotism and, and of power. No one accumulated or exercised more power than Stalin in history. That's just a fact. He was Wall Street. He was um, Washington. He was Silicon Valley. He was Hollywood, all rolled into a single desk in office. So, but, you know, Putin, uh, he's no dummy. Any fool can get into power by accident. That's called history. But not any fool. It's British history. <laughs> <laughs> I did turn to you at that point, but I, yeah, I, you know, I did pick up. A and and, and one we got rid of that system. <laughs> and and like Silicon Valley, I'm not going to call the Tories your friends because some of them are probably now now your former friends. Uh, that they, that there are certain people who were never my friends. Now. I think it was called regression to, to the mean in genetics or something Russia. like that. School, schoolmates, <laughs> schoolmates, we could say. 
Ox <laughs> Oxford Union <laughs> politics on the global stage is not very we'll pretty. I think the... I'm quoting somebody. Yeah, I think I may have said that. We'll get into the quality of American leadership later. But coming back to Russia, Steve. Back to Putin. Yeah, so uh, he's no fool. He's been in power a really long time. And he's learned quite a bit, including about how power works in his system. And so he's got this fantastic Praetorian Guard. It's the largest of any institution that gets anywhere near him. It's his cooks, it's his drivers, it's his uh, IT personnel. It's 50,000 people. Yes, it's between 30 and 50,000 people. You're exactly right. And there are no signs of defection or disaffection. Because all of those euros that other people who are not your friends are sending to Russia to purchase uh, Russian oil are going somewhere. And one of the places they're going is supporting their Praetorian Guard. So their salaries are higher, their perquisites are better, uh, their nests are very well feathered. And in any case, there are some of those nationalists that we were talking about earlier who are being rewarded in the current conjuncture rather than being weeded out. So until we see defection or significant disaffection in the Praetorian Guard, that gigantic cocoon in which he operates, we can't say his regime is in danger. So we see, for example, a member of the city council in St. Petersburg publicly calls for Putin's uh, resignation. It's an incredibly courageous act by this woman to do that, and then she gets other colleagues to sign the petition, sign on to that, and it's amazing in the atmosphere uh, we have there in Russia today and the consequences that could uh, fall on her head that she does this, but it doesn't penetrate the Praetorian Guard that we're talking about. And so even the defense industry and the uh, successor to the KGB, they don't have the kind of access to Putin uh, that this Praetorian Guard does. They're not the regime. There's a court society of people who are Putin's friends, his cook, his judo partner, Prigozhin with his Wagner group. That's the court society. Yes. Then there's a formal regime, which is the construction foreman impersonating a defense minister, Sergei uh, Shaigu. And, and then He's got a lot of medals, though. A lot of medals. Yes, he does. And, and God bless him. He must have built a lot of prefab apartment buildings in his day. But, but anyway, there's the formal regime uh, the, after the court society, and then there's the actual regime, which is a part that we haven't seen, as I said, the kind of anti-Putin movement there. And if we did see it, they'd be hung up upside down in the lobby, uh, strangled for everyone to see, just to make sure that no one else had that kind of idea. We're still talking about Moscow politics, which is about like talking about beltway politics, but actually... It's not clear to me that, that there is, this is a, still a colonial empire. And um, how much does Putin control what goes on in remote parts of the country? Dagestan, so I gather, for example, when, when, he, when he puts up the, yeah. uh, the draft, the draft is not done centrally. It's done by regional governors. Yeah. And regional governors, I gather, and this, I want, this is ahead. a question, <clears throat> they're starting to think, well, uh, when the knives come out, do I want my best fighting guys all dead in Ukraine or do I want them around me? Are, are we not starting to build alternative centers of power for the inevitable um, civil war that comes when Putin starts to shake? And yes, he's got his Praetorian Guard. I love your optimism. <laughs> it's not optimism. <laughs> I, what, what, what do you, how about a step down from that? What if they just stop doing what he tells them to do? But it, what if he says mobilize another 200,000? The, the question I want is, is that, th there's a ahead. common mistake of Americans and to look at China or Russia yeah. and imagine it as a one unitary coherent right. power. Everything's run from Putin. It's a dictator. I mean, Stalin did run everything. Uh, and then to look at America and say, oh, God, what a mess. <laughs> but every country is its own mess, and every dictatorship is weak. And clearly yeah. people are looking for the end of this is, is bad and, and, and getting ready for, you know, that when the mafia don dies, there's the knives come out. That's the one thing they don't do well is transfers of power. So what's going on inside Russia if you take this view away from the view of the, the one dictator runs everything and everybody obeys because there's a Praetorian guard? Yeah, you've hit upon... The, the biggest and most important point about authoritarian regimes. They're terrible. <laughs> They're terrible at everything. But th if they only have to succeed at one thing. Fear. They have to suppress political alternatives. 
you see if there are no political alternatives, they can survive any level of incompetence and criminality and abuse of their population and of their North leaders. North Korea. Yes. Venezuela. But if you have a political alternative, all of a sudden, it's a different dynamic. And so this is, this is why when people talk about deterring China, I, I, I have a, an allergic reaction because they talk about deterring China. We'll put some economic sanctions on China. We'll deny them some kind of technology or whatever it might be. The way you deter a communist regime or a one-party state or a individual despotism is you create the possibility of alternatives inside the system for others to imagine or exist. But in Russia, there's this regional alternative, right? There's East Nowhere Stand. You don't have to just take over Moscow. I've been to East Nowhere Stand. <laughs> I'm probably the only person yes. of this distinguished panel who's been there. And I won't give you the details about daily life there, and, and I won't take out my uh, photographs of the trip, <laughs> but I will try to answer your question, which is to say that it's a demobilization regime. The regime is very good at preventing people from mobilizing. You can't come out on the street. You can't hold a conversation together. You can't get five people together in a cafe. That's already illegal, right? So. They're great at demobilizing, which is preventing people from gathering, whether in protest or for any reason. Then they switch to mobilization. How's a demobilization regime going to do at mobilization? Well, you can guess. It's going to do the same at mobilization, a demobilization regime, as a, a, a democratic regime is going to do on energy policy. Right? You kind of know the answer before the question's even asked in some <laughs> cases. Right, because... Yeah, it's where just, we, well, that's where we try to emulate It's communists. not their thing. <laughs> it's just not part of their wheelhouse. And so they flubbed it, and it came out a mess. And yet, more people evidently um, uh, went along with the mobilization than opposed the mobilization in the end. We're not sure about that because the information is hard to pinpoint, right? The, you're... you're tracking social media reports in nowhere stand and everywhere else. But it looks like they were able to mobilize significant numbers of people. So despite the fact that this was not the regime's forte, despite the fact that people got on buses and, and swam down rivers to get out of the country, despite everything we heard about, we didn't hear about the part where they reported for duty, they, they got a, the semblance of a uniform, they were put on a train, and they got 15 minutes of instruction about how to load a rifle, and then they were put in the field. Which, right? by the way, roughly describes how you know, your hero Stalin did when he had to do large-scale mobilization in World War II. It wasn't pretty, but in the end, let's take the case of the uh, the war against Finland. Yeah. Uh, they start off terribly. There's a shambolic performance, but they do have ultimately greater strength and they win that war. I wanted to bring this round to Ukraine. It seems yeah. to me, okay. however long Putin has, <clears throat> he's probably going to live longer than the decisive phase of this war. I want to say, hey, U.S. Lend Lease played a big role in that, and now the Lend Lease is going to Ukraine. Right. So, so my question for you, Steve, is that he mobilized enough, the system delivered enough men to keep the Russian war effort going, yeah. even if it is at a very low level of skill and training. They are also now using missiles as well as Iranian drones to inflict some really major damage on Ukraine's infrastructure. Most of us are following, if we're following it at all, what's going on on the front line, and that is still going Ukraine's way. But if I look at the Ukrainian economy, if I look at the damage that Russia is able to inflict on Ukraine, if I ask myself, how long is the West going to keep writing these checks? I'm getting a little uneasy about where we're going to be if Putin can get through the winter. What's your current read? You guys are really into this, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. This multi-way conversation sports, of good fellows. Sports is obviously I bet more interesting. When, but... I bet when you call your wives and yet again tell them... Our wives. And yet again you tell them that you're going to be late for dinner because you're still at the office taping a good fellow show that they actually believe it. Steve, we're gonna swap this... them out. We're gonna swap them out for the wives at some point and just have the wives <laughs> show. Wives are way better. I mean seriously. It's prettier. <laughs> no, it's small to take. Can it's we get smart. back to the war? Why we were on something good for a second. <laughs> All right, all right. The war, yes. Where, where's it going? Well, we, well, we, have, well, we have dinner together with our spouses. The topics of conversation are slightly different. 
not that different. Not that different. But not that different. <laughs> Just to be clear. All right. So, so um, You've done enough to eke out some miserable Pyrrhic victory. So um, everything starts with the bravery and ingenuity of the Ukrainians. That's why we're in the place we're in. Those people are dying as we speak, as we're taping this show. And uh, they're willing to die for the freedom of their country. And it's an amazing story. It's inspiring, and it's made possible many other consequences that we're benefiting from. So everything starts with the Ukrainian people, and we have to remember that. This is their war. They're doing the fighting. They're doing the dying. And, and Putin is being degraded, and Xi Jinping is being humiliated, and the European unity and resolve is coming. You want to talk about equations, I know I'm stepping on your turf here, but <laughs> we have an equation. It's Ukrainian valor plus Russian atrocities equals Western unity and resolve. So the more valor and the more atrocities, and they keep coming, the more we have Western unity and resolve. So but it starts with that Ukrainian valor. So where are we in the war? Uh, Ukrainians are incredible at information war. It's just breathtaking. I don't know if we're ever gonna get to the level that they're at, no, but I've been going to school at what they've been doing. And it's their Ministry of Defense, it's everything. It's, 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 it's the whole society, but it's even the institutions that we didn't think very, were very agile have turned out to be amazing. So they come up with this battle plan. Uh, in, uh, first of all, they, they uh, prevent their capital from being taken. You know that Putin uh, dusted off the Rumsfeld Iraq plan. Remember that? The Rumsfeld Iraq plan, he dusted it off, and he says, okay, I'm going to invade a gigantic country with a force that's too small. I'm going to decapitate the regime, and then they're going to welcome me with flowers. And everything's going to be hunky-dory as soon as I decapitate the regime. So we, our military was breathtaking. We went in there and we crushed every, th every asset the Iraqis had. We decapitated the regime. Uh, our performance was so stunning that the Chinese went into a tizzy and the Russians went into a tizzy from the Iraq war, which was televised. But the plan didn't work in the end because uh, we didn't flip the society just by decapitating the regime and the force was too small to own the country in a stable way. The Saudi gains, yeah. Right. And so the Rumsfeld battle plan didn't work, but Putin dusted it off. He said, we're going to do it again. So they invade a gigantic country with a force that's too small, and they try to decapitate the regime, and the idea is that people are going to welcome them with flowers. Honestly, it's very analogous. The difference is they had lots of collaborators that they thought were going to help with this, which was They had people who took money. Right. To, to pretend to be collaborators. Of, failure of that collaboration. I could have done that, but I never take money from the mafia. <laughs> Your friends. Your but friends. anyway, so the Russian army is not the American army, so they didn't destroy the assets. The Russian army, uh, also, they didn't capture Kiev. They didn't decapitate the regime because the Ukrainians resisted successfully. So, uh, and they also, they didn't have enough force to occupy the country. And so it was the Rumsfeld battle plan, which failed even worse than the Rumsfeld version of it, because Rumsfeld was actually successful on the battlefield in the initial it was stages. Also to some extent, the Soviet Afghan battle plan. I mean, there was some yes. 1979 elements here, which were yes, quite you, yes, you've heard me talk about that. That Afghanistan in '79 uh, was a coup, not an invasion. They replaced, the, they they murdered the existing Afghan president. They installed their own puppet. And then they decided to stay around and protect themselves with some security force, which was about 80,000 in the beginning, and it grew into invasion. Or as the coup grew into an invasion unintended. As George Soros once said to me, um, an investment is a speculation gone bad. So an invasion is a coup. Elon Musk about that. Yeah, so <laughs> actually, I don't think anybody needs to tell him. I think it's pretty clear. But an invasion is a coup gone bad in, in the Ukrainian case, right? Okay, so now let's switch. The Ukrainians defend themselves. Russians make some gains in the east, slogging uh, through a, a couple of towns, et cetera, but they're not, uh, they don't have a combined arms operation at scale capability that they're going to take the country, either from the east or the south. The Ukrainians switch over to the NATO battle plan, NATO World War II, uh, NATO Cold War. 
Why? Why? What am I talking about? If you remember, the Soviets have this massive troop presence and armor in Europe. And it's too big for the West to oppose in a frontal encounter. The Soviets just have way too many troops and way too much armor. But we have a more intelligent plan, which is we're going to destroy their logistics, their supply, and their command and control behind the lines to disrupt their ability to conduct operations. So we're going to fight the battle that we can fight against the army that's bigger than us with more armor. This is what the Ukrainians have switched to. They've switched to this because we enable them with our long-range weaponry that they can strike behind Russian lines, disrupt Russian fuel depots and Russian uh, transportation, Russian communication, command and control, and make the Russians incapable of offensive operations and maybe even loosen them up to push them back a little bit. So this has been a fantastic plan with a twist. The twist was Zelensky decided they were going to do a frontal assault all the same on Kherson province in the south to get back the Sea of Azov littoral and to make Crimea vulnerable again. Unless he comes up with this plan, they take it to our people, and our people say, let's war game that. And they war game that a couple of times, and the Ukrainians pounding the Russian positions, which are well defended, uh, lots of troops dug in, some armor. And the better troops in the south. The first wave exactly. of replacements are the ones in the north around Kharkiv. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they can't make any progress mm. in the war games in the south. So gently, our side suggests to the Ukrainians, why don't we attack the weakest part of the Russian front, which is the northeast around the second biggest city, Kharkiv, where the Russians uh, are actually not army there, it's police force, it's National Guard, kind of paramilitary and these, police. these volunteer battalions that were raised. Volunteer them, battalions yeah. and some criminal battalions, as the yeah. general knows. And so it's the weakest part, and in fact the Russians decide to withdraw from that area and so the battle plan is now, it looks like an invasion frontally in the south, but that turns into partly a deception because now we're going to hit them where they're weak. There's no second echelon, there's no third echelon. They, they ride those Bushmasters, those fantastic Austra from our Australian friends, those great armored personnel carriers, the Bushmasters and some other great... So the Ukrainians ride in into almost empty space because... There, there's very little defense on the Russian side. There's a lot of weaponry that the Ukrainians can capture. Most of it is not usable immediately, but a lot of it is good for spare pistol. It's genius. The same day they hit this area where the Russians are retreating anyway and make the retreat accelerate and capture the weaponry, they go on social media, put up all of the photographs of the captured Russian weapons, they talk about their amazing combined arms operation uh, that they mounted with artillery and tanks and skilled infantry, none of which happened, but all of which Lawrence Friedman tweeted about. Uh, willing dupes are really valuable in a war. And then they asked the Europeans for $17 billion more aid because, look, we can push the Russians back. We can win this war. We can win an offensive. And so it looked like a brilliant offensive that was actually an information war success. Well, they did take back 1,200 square kilometers in the north by turning them out of positions, which is what you don't want. You don't want to yes. impel yourself on defenses. They did, I think it was, yes, it it was, was the, right form, the right form of maneuver. Yeah. It, it was really, and you know better than I do, General, and, and you, you know better than I do where this came from, and you know that this wasn't the original Ukrainian plan, but was modified, not in a diktat, but through the war gaming lessons that we imparted. But information war can be just as important, and the maneuvering that, was, uh, that happened there, I'm not trying to downgrade it, I'm just trying to say that the great victory was in the information space, because Ukrainian morale was boosted, Russian morale and reputation was dented, and then Europeans and Americans, the Allies, said, we can win this thing, let's support it even more. So Ukrainian valor plus Russian atrocities equals Western Union. But here's the final twist on this, if you'll let me. I know that um, they bit your ear off already. I see the general is the one closest to you. <laughs> Phil, Mike, I, Mike Tyson here. <laughs> I see that you, I'm, I'm not trying to bite your other ear off, but I just want to get one final point, and if this is okay. 
Uh, I know I'm talking too much, but then again, you invited me to the show. Based that on is the point. It is the whole point of the show, Steve. Okay, I mean. so here we go. <laughs> so, but the Russians can learn too. And the Russians are now fighting the same battle plan adapted from the NATO Cold War experience, which is to say we don't have the force structure or the weaponry now to have a frontal combined arms operation to push the Ukrainians away. Let's destroy their capability to fight. But we're not going to do that by taking on NATO. We're not going to bomb the bases in Germany and Poland and elsewhere, Romania, where the weapons are coming from and where they're being shipped into Ukraine and where troops are being trained. We're going to destroy Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. We're going to eliminate their power supply. We're going to cut off their water supply. And we're going to go up the escalation ladder, and we'll get their communications too. Because all their communications are just a few Elon Musk-owned satellites, and they're susceptible to Russian destruction. And, it, and they're not owned by the Pentagon. They're owned by a private guy. And so Putin can call Elon on the phone and say, Elon, you take those satellites away from Ukraine, or somebody else might take those satellites. So if you can make them unable to fight because they have no power, right? They have no lights and they have no communications potentially. We haven't gotten to that stage, but that's what I envision as the next stage if Russia needs that stage. You can get the Ukrainians to be unable to continue the battle until they get power supply back, water supply back, and communicate. So, let's just, so that's where we are in the war so right now. That's where we are. Let's close out with two questions. Your thoughts on near-term outlook for the war and near-term outlook for Putin's Russia. Yeah, so why didn't we supply the uh, air defense systems more quickly? And secondly, why aren't we doing that now? If the problem is the Russians have enough capability still to knock out the most valuable pieces of Ukraine. And now, and now with the Iranian drones and probably Iranian missiles. Exactly, soon, General. Soon, yeah. I mean, you, you know that you would be putting more air defense systems in there immediately, and then they would say, well, we need 100. You would say, okay, I'll give you 200, or I'll give you 500. I'll give you whatever you need, so that instead of uh, eight missiles of 50 getting through, zero missiles of 50 would get through and they could rebuild the power plants and the water supply and, and then we could figure out uh, alternative communications options if it should come to that. And so that's now. That's where we have to be right now. This is not to say that our uh, support should be unlimited. We're in a democracy. There are trade-offs. There's a legitimate debate here about what the war aims ought to be. But the immediate goal right now is to retain Ukraine's ability to fight through the winter. And we're not doing that as energetically as necessary. Can I give you another equation? Yes. So Russian exports yeah. plus uh, the Western attention deficit disorder equals a huge problem for Zelensky. Because remember, the Russian economy is down maybe 3%. The Ukrainian economy before the attacks on infrastructure was down 30%. And the situation in Ukraine economically is getting worse yes. by the day. Our attention deficit disorder hasn't fully manifested itself, but it will probably become obvious after the midterms that we're not all on board for a war that lasts right the way through next year. And this is why if you ask the question, what's the short run? The short run is the Ukrainians have got maybe a few more weeks, couple months to make more gains on the ground. But as they're making those gains, their economy is crashing. And we're going to realize that too late. And that at that point, it's advantage Putin. Yeah, I have to give some credit to the Biden administration here. Wait a uh, second, they, this is good fellas. They Stop pulled out of Afghanistan <laughs> in a way that was, uh, let's say, counterproductive. We this won't go there, but so we know. Well. <laughs> they pulled out of Afghanistan. They tried to do the same thing in Ukraine, evacuating the embassy and getting Zelensky out. But the Ukrainians gave them a gift that they didn't earn, but that they were wise enough to latch on to. The Europeans the same. Remember, this is like golf, right? This administration and geopolitics is like a plus 30 handicap. So if they score 90 or 95 on the golf course, they win the tournament because their handicap is so high. So that's where we are with them. But the problem is the definition of victory. 
That's where the whole problem is at this point. What's the definition of victory? Well, they wrongly think that it's not losing. So we're giving them enough ways to not lose. But, you know, there, there aren't many ties in warfare. You know, you've got to give them enough weapons to win because time is ultimately more on Russia's side, if I look ahead to next year. Though. I don't know if time is on anybody's side here because both sides are being degraded in very different ways. Uh, both societies are suffering in very different ways. It's the Ukrainians who are dying. It's the Russians who are fleeing. But, but let me just make the point about defining victory. So uh, our friends in Washington decided that Ukrainians are fighting, they get to decide what victory is. We won't tell them. We won't attach strings to our support. We won't tell them that we're not going to go all the way here, we're not going to go all the way there. And so Zelensky filled that vacuum and defined victory as follows. Uh, every inch of Ukrainian soil, reparations from the Russians, and war crimes tribunals. So that definition of victory is fully understandable given what they're going through, the atrocities that we've been speaking about. But is that really the definition of victory? Victory is what the Ukrainian society, which rose up twice in our lifetime against local dictators, let alone against the foreign invader, their idea of victory is inclusion in the West, access to the West. Inclusion in the EU in the first instance and in NATO. It's not territorial necessarily. It's not necessarily reparations. It's Ukraine is a uh, legally entered member of the European Union and has some type of security guarantee, whether that's with NATO or some other version that the general is better placed to discuss. So that definition of victory doesn't necessarily require that Russia get evicted from every piece of Ukrainian soil, but that's not the definition of victory that anybody is talking about because it's, quote, sensitive to talk about EU accession for Ukraine, or it's sensitive to talk about NATO accession for Ukraine. But in fact, those are the conversations we need to be having in order to maintain war support that you alluded to, might wane, and in order to understand that if they don't completely evict Russia from on the battlefield, they can still win a victory here, which is a victory of the West admits a member because there's an accession process and there's institutional reform, right? You're talking about a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Re reconstruction costs, you've seen the numbers, the 350 billion and up, right? Ukrainian GDP prior to the war was half of that, was 180 billion. So how are those institutions going to absorb 350 billion, twice their GDP, legally and successfully, and reconstruct themselves? If you know anything about COVID aid and how much COVID aid was given away and what percentage of that of our GDP was and where it went, you understand that this is a challenge not because Ukrainians are bad people, not because the Zelensky's not a, a good leader, but because any country would be hard pressed to absorb that level of reconstruction with that size economy and those institutions. So we need to talk about reconstruction and how it would work in practice institutionally. And we need to talk about joining the West. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, Maybe. It seems to me pretty hard to do that kind of reconstruction. Wars can end with armistice. It doesn't necessarily end with a peace. I mean, I have to tell you about the Korean Peninsula. And look at South Korea. Look at what South Korea achieved without a, either a victory or a peace treaty. That's a three-year time frame. Right. That so is. speaking of timing in Ukraine, time is up for the show. I do want to exit, though, with one very quick question. This is Tuesday the 1st. There's an election in this country a week from today. So we're going to put you all on the spot here. Neil, what are you going to be watching on election night? I'm going to see if the Senate flips, which I think it will, narrowly. So just a few states that will decide this. be watching that very closely. I think that's... That's the most likely scenario at this point. Obviously, the House is going to turn, turn Republican, but I think the Senate's going to be close, and you can see which states to watch. HR, what are you watching for? Okay, you know, I'm, I'm not a political person, so I, you know, I'll just defer to Neil and you guys, and uh, actually you. You're, uh, you're, you're back in the world. You're still yeah. back in the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh, the Phillies hopefully will emerge victorious uh, in that same time frame. There you go, John. <laughs> the triumph of hope over experience, let me tell you from a Chicago Cubs fan. 
Uh, I'll be watching. Um, Won the World Series in 2016, and that was a. Uh, Once a century, we're ready to go. Electorally interesting uh, I think the interesting question is what happens after the election. The Republicans, uh, let's say they take the ten Senate, they are now the dog that caught the car. Uh, we're at a remarkable moment of realignment. Um, the Democrats, um, we, we kind of dumped on their foreign policies, but they are now becoming the, the strong foreign policy. Many yeah. voices in the Republican Party want to become isolationist. Uh, will they do that, or will they take up the defense? I, I think victory is a much larger global question of do we live in a world where Putin's get negotiated with, or do we keep up what we said in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons? So uh, the larger realignment of if they gain some power, what the Republicans do with it, uh, and to what extent do Democrats, if they lose a lot of power, recognize the, ex the damage their extreme progressive wing of the party is doing. The, the, the realignment after, I think, is the interesting story. Steve, did you trade in your New York ballot for a California ballot? You know, um, April 15th is the day that I usually watch because that's the day that I get crushed. That's You're going to get really crushed <laughs> this year. <laughs> you know, um, I, I actually, you're not going to believe this. I worked in New Jersey at Princeton University, paid taxes, lived in Manhattan, New York City, paid taxes in New York City and New York State. My wife works at Harvard, we paid taxes in Massachusetts, and I had an adjunct appointment in California, and so I paid taxes in California, California Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. So I'm the only person you've ever met who's moving to California to lower his taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That'll never happen again. And we will end on that surreal note. Steve, I want you to look in the camera and say thank you to all those people in Kotkin Nation who begged for you to be on the show. <laughs> Tell them you enjoyed it. It was my pleasure to be here today, and I look forward to your comments online. Does he amuse you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. And, and I'm, we're I'm, lucky I'm, to have, have you here in the senior fellowship. I'll sense of humor doesn't hurt. Although I'm still trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this episode of Goodfellows. We're taping in a couple days from now. And the good news for John Cochran, who's been outnumbered by historians on this show. Economists will rule the next show. HR is going to be up. It will be joined by Tyler Cowan. John, we're going to talk about AI and a few other things, right? With Tyler on the show, we're going to talk about everything. And a lot of food, <laughs> a lot of food probably, too. Not to be missed. So don't miss that episode. A few days, Tyler Cowan. Uh, once again, on behalf of the Goodfellows, Neil Ferguson, HR McMaster, John Cochran, Steve Cochran, we hope you enjoyed the show today. Thanks always for watching. We appreciate the comments and we will see you soon. Take care. If you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring HR McMaster, watch Battlegrounds, also available at hoover.org. Funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you.